He's the Messiah, the new leader. He was very charming. He was very magnetic. People were just instinctively drawn to him. That his ideas were so right and so strong, he believed that he was right in what he was doing. Glenn Taylor, Glenn Taylor Helzer zealously decides he must absolutely overthrow the Church of Latter-day Saints. He needs a lot of money for the project. He couldn't just extort the money from them. He'd also have to kill them. They dismembered the bodies, put them in various duffel bags. A special dive team from Marin County slowly makes their way onto the McCullamy River this morning. The same day, body parts were discovered in the Delta. On Monday, August 7th, 2000, in the Sacramento Delta in California, an amateur yachtsman has just notified the Coast Guard. In the following days, other bags rise to the surface and float adrift. While San Joaquin and Sacramento Delta divers recuperate the bags that are half emerged near the shore, other policemen, including a coroner, patrol the surface of a wider zone. It's the same team that pulled five duffel bags from Delta waters yesterday. The body parts were intermingled and placed in duffel bags, and stones and rocks were also placed in the duffel bags. Given his experience, the coroner knows what to expect. And unfortunately, one of the bag's contents will confirm his fears. The bag contains parts of a dismembered body. At least one unidentified victim has just been found at the mouth of the McCullamy River. A total of nine bags will be found. But the early evening news bulletin on a local TV station lingers almost exclusively on a more heinous affair, the murder of Jenny Villaran and James Gamble. The arrest of three suspects is broadcast. A woman, Don Godman, and two brothers, Justin and Glenn Taylor Helzer. Glenn Taylor, Helzer. Glenn Taylor Helzer was born on July 26, 1970. He is Karma and Gerald Helzer's firstborn. They're fervent believers, members of the Church of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as the Mormons. The Helzer couple have two other children, Justin Allen and Heather. But out of the three, Glenn Taylor remains the favorite. From the beginning, his mother believed that he was a prophet of God. She always treated him like that, so the rest of the family did too. Essentially, the whole family revolved around him, uh, around his magnetic personality, his outgoing nature, and there was a certain kind of deference to him, even though he was still a child, uh, because of his mother's very strong belief that he was a prophet. He goes through childhood, arousing not only his parents' admiration, but also the admiration of the congregation members. Everyone has nothing but good to say about young Taylor. And he isn't only his mother's favorite, but he is also his brother Justin's hero, who sees his older brother as the perfect role model. Justin Helzer was Glenn's little brother, and he was the introverted little brother um, compared to Glenn's extroverted, bold, big brother role. And Glenn often told him, I'm number one and you're number two. Basically, his role was set as Glenn's follower from a young age. Glenn Taylor's adolescence goes on inside, in harmony, with Latter-day Saints. Six, he's acknowledged by the patriarchs and ordained with the organization. He essentially wants to devote himself to religious life, so he drops out of high school to dedicate himself completely to follow the Lord's path. When he was 19, Taylor went on a mission, which is typical of Mormon men of that age. Uh, they are sent on a mission by the church, and the church decided to send Taylor to Brazil. He went down to Brazil, and he was phenomenally successful as a missionary. He was converting people, he was preaching, he was drawing large crowds, he was just doing wonders. 
Glenn Taylor is a little zealous because when his colleagues, missionaries who accompany him, occasionally tell lewd jokes in private, Glenn Taylor quickly takes out his Bible and reads a few passages to bring them back to order. While in Brazil, his fanaticism might be attributed to, I feel like saying, to people's expectations of him, in that he was someone who had an air of success, who was perceived as having a great future in the organization, in the religion. And he acted that way to live up to expectations. Hence, he was even more meticulous, more rigorous than others. He knew things that others didn't, which he'd learned quickly. He seems like someone who just wants to look better than his peers. Upon his return in 1991, his experience in Brazil has left him a bitter taste. He's a little disappointed. He even has the impression that the Church of Latter-day Saints is a little slack and losing their battle against evil. Because he had been such a star in his family, he thought he had the same kind of rights where he was down in Brazil. He started butting heads with the church establishment, always thought he was right, he knew better. When Taylor came back from Brazil, he got married and he settled down, he got a job, he had a child. He was a stockbroker and he was very good at it. Clean cut and all of that, but then he started to change. Between his work and his life as a married man, Taylor feels trapped. He has the impression that his destiny is passing him by, but he is convinced that God has other plans for him. For a Mormon, this was very strange. He started drinking a lot, taking illegal drugs, watching pornos. And sleeping around, stepping out on his wife. In the summer of 1996, Taylor has had enough. He wants to live new experiences. He abandons wife and children and starts to go out with the fringe in the greater area of San Francisco. He started wearing all black, he started showering less, and his his philosophy started evolving about this idea that he was a prophet of God. Glenn Taylor Helzer zealously decides that he must absolutely overthrow the Church of Latter-day Saints. Strayed from God's path, and apparently he has the solution. So, he needs a lot of money for his project. He searches left and right. He will move in all kinds of circle, hoping to self-finance his project. And it's obvious to him that he doesn't only need money, but also time. As he works for Dean Witter in a small broker's office, he convinces a psychiatrist that he's suffering from depression, and he obtains sick leave. Away from work, he can dedicate all of his time to his project to change America. He can always count on the help of his brother Justin, who follows him around like a shadow. He will begin selling drugs, amphetamines, psychotropic drugs at rave parties. But obviously, he's far from obtaining the satisfaction he seeks. He is aware that his downward spiral distances him from the Book of Mormons. But Taylor firmly believes that God has placed him on this path. And if such is the case, he tells himself there must be a divine purpose. So Glenn Taylor is searching for himself. He will find seminars in other organizations. He will enroll in seminars centered on finding his personal values. These types of seminars flirt with brainwashing. So the people who are enrolled must talk about their faults and personal journeys, which will often give way to insults and verbal abuse. In fact, the purpose is to deconstruct individuals to better reconstruct them. Glenn Taylor will exploit this maneuver to better control the people around him. In the following months, his cause appears with astonishing clarity. He hears voices telling him about his mission, prepare Christ's imminent return. Of course, he continues to attend the Church of the Latter-day Saints in Concord, California. But his radical viewpoints place him in an uneasy position. In 1999, during a mystery murder evening organized by the Church of Mormons, Taylor meets Don Gong. 
a young, plain child who has been seeking her way throughout her childhood. Dawn met Taylor and Justin at a murder mystery dinner, of all things. They became friends and gradually Taylor began to pull her in, get her to trust him and believe in him. Stand up, stand up. Eventually, Taylor talked Dawn into going to a group training seminar. The seminars were very stressful. People could not eat, they couldn't sleep, they weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. It was to break down all barriers and then be built back up. Taylor wanted to do the same thing with Justin and Don. You break everything down and then you create them in your image. This was a several day long seminar. And he'd had many friends go through this, but he knew, he knew how impressionable Don was and he knew that this, this would be the, this would seal the deal for him. And it did. She was essentially completely broken down, become, you know, very, it destroyed her self-confidence, her self-worth. And at the very end, the, the trainer um, ordered her to either leave the seminar or take off her temple garment, which is um, a holy undergarment that uh, Mormons wear. And she knew that if she left the seminar, she would lose Taylor. That would be it. He would have nothing to do with her. So she took off the garment and Taylor knew that he had her. Taylor felt he would be a better leader of the Mormon church. And his grandiose personality traits were really coming to the fore at this point. So Glenn Helzer came up with this idea that he was a prophet and he was going to overthrow the Mormon church and be the real leader. And how is he going to do this? Well, he came up with several very bizarre scenarios. One was to adopt orphans from Brazil and to train them to become assassins and kill the leaders of the Mormon church. Another idea he had was recruiting young women at raves and turning them into high-priced prostitutes, which he would then use to lure married businessmen and blackmail them. Along the same lines, during a rave in April 2000, he meets Selena Bishop, who seems to be another easy prey. Selena Bishop was a happy-go-lucky 22-year-old. She had just gotten her own apartment for the first time. She was living on her own. She was waitressing. She was happy and bubbly and just having a good time like any 22-year-old. Again, this was somebody who was under Glenn Helzer's charismatic spell. He treated her like a queen at first, but he lied to her. He told her his name was Jordan, and he acted very strange. She knows that Jordan sells amphetamines, but it doesn't really bother her. And they become friends and start going out together. They meet in cafes. She knows that Jordan is a little mysterious. She doesn't know everything about him. As his plans took shape, his plans to extort money, kill people, and compile the money that he needed, he had decided that he needed someone to help him launder that money once he had extorted it. He says he's expecting a large sum of money, something like $125,000. But Jordan also tells her that he's afraid his ex-wife will get her hands on it. So he asks Selena to open a bank account in which he will secretly deposit the said $125,000 check to keep his wife in the dark. He offers Selena Bishop $25,000 for the transaction for her collaboration. Obviously, she accepts the proposition. But she never had any idea what was really going on, uh, what his, Taylor's real plans were. Glenn Taylor Helzer selects July 30th, 2000 to launch his jihad, his war against the Mormons. He will contact Deborah McClanahan, who's involved within the group, She's a member of the Children of Thunder, however, 
She's not involved in the definite plan. So Glenn Taylor tells her that she must buy four tickets for the 8.10 p.m. showing of the film X-Men. He also tells her that she must keep the receipts of the tickets because they will serve for as an alibi. He explains his implications in an important drug transaction and if the police ever got too interested in his activities, the receipts would serve not only as an alibi, but also to get away, to escape from the police's attention. From then on, the Children of Thunder are on the warpath. The plan can be unleashed. But here again, Glenn Taylor lies to Deborah about his true intentions, for it is a third woman, Dawn Godman, who will participate in the final mission. He sends each step of the plan to his accomplices, his brother Justin and Dawn Godman. He decided that he would look into his clients that he'd had as a stockbroker, wealthy retirees with lots of money who would be easy, weak victims, and decided that that would be the best way to go. When Taylor was working at Dean Witters, he had met a couple of excellent clients, Ivan and Annette Steinman. Ivan and Annette Steinman were a retired couple and they lived in Conk, California. They were your typical, wonderful, retired people. They traveled, they had timeshares, they went out to lunch with friends. They just really enjoyed their life. And they had, they had two adult daughters um, whom they just adored. They thought of Glenn Helzer as a son. They, he became very friendly with them. He cultivated a friendship with them, going to their house. He very nefariously developed this relationship with them, thinking about the possibility of someday extorting their money from them. Taylor knows that the Steinman's assets amount to approximately $100,000 thanks to his clever advice. It's perfect. Around 8 p.m., the trio arrive at the Steinman's. Taylor will take care of Annette and Ivan while Justin waits in the garage. As for Dawn, she will join them later at the house on Saddlewood Court. Taylor knew that if he showed up on their doorstep, they would let him in even though it had been several years since they had last seen him. When Ivan opens the door, he is truly stunned to greet his ex-financial advisor. Despite his surprise and without hesitation, he invites him in and Annette offers him a coffee. So far, everything is going smoothly. Taylor justifies his surprise visit on the pretext of sharing new business opportunities with them. While the couple expects to talk about financial issues, Taylor takes out a 9mm pistol from his briefcase and aims it at Ivan. Then he asks Annette to get certain financial documents. Meanwhile, Ivan tries to negotiate with Taylor in vain. Taylor briefly looks over the familiar documents and satisfied with his brief review, takes handcuffs out of his briefcase and orders Ivan to handcuff his wife. Once handcuffed, the Steinman couple is escorted to the garage where Justin forces them into their minivan. The Helsers then forced them into their own minivan. Then they drove the minivan back to the house where the Helsers were staying, took the Steinmans inside. Taylor tells Ivan that he needs the money to leave the country, and if he obeys without making any trouble, he and Annette will be freed safe and sound. With no other choice, the octogenarian agrees. As it is already late, the Children of Thunder have no other choice but to wait until morning to pursue their plan. So they place a mattress in the middle of the living room and force the Steinmans to lie down. Everyone feels that the night seems endless.
At the stroke of 6 a.m., Taylor and Don go to a phone booth. Dean Witter's California offices are surely closed this early in the morning, unlike the East Coast offices. Pretending to be Annette Steinman, Don Godman contacts an employee and asks to liquidate her assets. At the other end of the line, the employee explains that the transaction, it's $100,000 after all, takes a few hours and will surely incur severe penalties. Don replies that it's an emergency and that she has no other choice. Persuaded she is talking to Annette Steinman, the employee assures her that she will make the transition and deposit the money in their account in the next few hours. Don and Taylor are satisfied and return to the bungalow. They wake up the Steinmans and force them to take a few Rohypnol pills, a strong sedative also known as the rape drug. To reassure them, Taylor explains that there's no danger. He simply wants to numb them a little to make sure they don't cause Don any trouble during his and Justin's absence. Ivan and Annette obey and the drugs kick in quickly. Taking advantage of their semi-consciousness, Taylor asks Don to write two checks in the name of Selena Bishop in the amounts of 33,000 and 67,000. Then have Annette and Ivan sign both of them. They forced the Steinmans to write out checks from their retirement accounts. Once they are in possession of the checks, the Children of Thunder go on to the next step. Justin. Taylor decided that their usefulness was over. So after the Steinmans didn't die from overdosing on Rohypnol, they led them to the bathroom. He and Justin started beating them. Justin bashed Ivan Steinman's head against the tile floor. Ivan, as a result of the beatings, had a heart attack and died. Annette did not die, and eventually Taylor slit her throat. Taylor, Justin, and Don are aware that what they've done is wrong. Worse yet, it is a condemnable act according to the Book of Mormons. But what they've just done has been done for God. Convinced that they are already forgiven, they join hands and pray, thanking the Steinmans for sacrificing their lives for their cause. By performing a ritual and saying prayers, it's as if they'd reduced the impact of the murder. It helps to clear their conscience and free them from guilt. If they did it for a cause, if the cause is just and good, let's just perform a ritual and we won't have to feel guilty since we did it for a good cause. Then, Glenn Taylor Helzer and the Children of Thunder killed the Steinmans. But in their vision to change America, it was for a good cause. His ideas were so right and so strong and he could voice them in such a, a powerful way to his brother and to other people as to he believed that he was right in what he was doing. So Glenn Taylor will ask Don Godman to write a $10,000 check from Annette Steinman's checkbook. The $10,000 check is made out to her husband Ivan Steinman. Glenn Taylor asks her to take the check to a distant branch and to transfer it from one bank account to another. Through strange logic, he will ask Don Godman to wear a lime green jogging suit, a cowboy hat, sunglasses, and use a wheelchair. It's difficult to understand why, but in Glenn Taylor's mind, a mobility-challenged person in a wheelchair cannot be a crook, and according to him, it will make it easier for the check transfer. No one at the bank would ever suspect an illicit act from such a check holder. So Don Godman follows Glenn Taylor's instructions. Dressing accordingly, she drives to Petaluma, which is about one hour from Concord, and will deposit the check.
During Dawn's absence, Taylor and Justin take care of the Steinman couple's bodies. A macabre task that they accomplish by dismembering the corpses with an electric saw. The remains are placed in a duffel bag until they are thrown into the delta of the Sacramento River as planned. Everything worked well in the first part of the plan. Don Godman has no problem depositing the check and she casually returns home. Don arrives at Saddlewood Court and joins Taylor and Justin. The drudgery to make all traces of the crime disappear demands long and sustained efforts from the two brothers, and it is too late to collect the Steinman's money. So the trio will have to wait a few more hours before cashing in. On Tuesday, August 1st, 2000, it's time for the second part of the bank plan. So Don Godman will put on her lime green costume, sunglasses, cowboy hat, and wheelchair. This time, she will go to the Calfed Bank in Walnut Creek. It's a different branch of the bank she visited the previous day. She rolled in to the bank with this check. The check was for you know, six figures, so she was sent over to a woman named Vicki Sexton, was fed this story by Dawn. And she hands her two checks amounting to $100,000. Then she tells her a story she can see right through. She tells her the Steinmans mandated her to deposit the check. She asks for the checks to be deposited in Selena Bishop's account, a good friend of hers, and also tells her Selena Bishop is the Steinman's granddaughter. She's awaiting surgery, and the money must be deposited in her account. The story seems obscure. Um, Ms. Sexton said, well, that's great, but I'm going to need to talk to the Steinmans. This is a lot of money. I need to talk to them personally before any check is cleared. Obviously, Don Godman gets quite worried when she sees Miss Sexton call the Steinmans when she knows they've been sent to the hereafter. She gets the Steinmans answering machine. Vicky Sexton leaves a message asking the Steinmans to call her as soon as they return. Obviously, Don Godman knows they will not return. She tries to argue and force Miss Sexton to deposit the money in Selena Bishop's account. But Miss Sexton is inflexible. And she tells Miss Godman, Don Godman, that the money will not be transferred until she gets the green light from the Steinmans. Finally, Don Godman has no other choice but to agree with her, and absolutely furious, she leaves the bank. Not only are the Children of Thunder not in possession of the money, they no longer have the checks that were left with Mrs. Sexton. When he learns about the bank episode, Taylor knows that he must eliminate all traces of the mess right away. Consequently, he returns to 2940 Frayne Lane, where nothing has changed. Good sign, says Taylor, who quickly finds the answering machine and steals the audio tape. Back at Saddlewood Court, he asks Dawn to call the California Federal Bank and imitate Annette's men to give them Annette's social security number. On Wednesday, August 2nd, 2000, Vicki Sexton finds a message on her answering machine at the office. Apparently, Mrs. Steinman called the previous evening to leave her social security number. Vicki Sexton calls the Steinmans again. No answer, not even the answering machine. Late in the morning, Don Godman calls the California Federal Bank to inquire about the status of her dossier. Vicki Sexton tells her that everything is in order, but without a live conversation with the Steinmans, she will not proceed with the transfer. Taylor began to panic. Things were, were not going as he had anticipated. Vicki Sexton is giving him a hard time. And what would happen if she had the brilliant idea to contact Selena Bishop? No doubt Selena would say that she knows nothing about it. For Taylor Heltzer, there's no other alternative. Selena Bishop must die. 
Taking on the role of Jordan once again, he contacts Selena and proposes a trip to Yosemite National Park the next day. He ends the call by inviting her to a bar in Berkeley. Glenn Taylor, alias Jordan, arrives at the bar around 7 p.m. Selena tells Jordan that she told her mother about their camping trip and she volunteered to house it for her daughter. After a few drinks, Jordan invites Selena to spend the night with him so they could leave early in the morning. And she was very excited. She was young. She was in love. And they were going to spend the night at his house before leaving the next day to drive up to Yosemite. They leave the bar and must each drive their own cars to Jordan's. It was the first time that she had been over there. Um, he had always been very secretive, you know, about his location and about everything about him. While Selena is having a shower, Taylor and Justin agree on how to proceed. When Jordan proposes to massage Selena, the young woman lies down on her stomach while Jordan straddles her backside. The fateful moment has come. And as he was massaging her, his brother Justin came in with a hammer. Justin creeps up from behind and deals a first blow. And bashed her head in repeatedly with a hammer. He cracked her skull but he didn't kill her. So when Glenn realized that she was still alive, he carried her to the bathroom and slit her throat as well, killing her. So Glenn didn't stop with Selena and the Steinmans because he'd accidentally met Selena's mother, Jennifer. He decided he had to kill Jennifer too. So in the middle of the night, he drove over, he drove over to Selena's studio apartment where her mother was house-sitting, and he discovers the mother in bed with her boyfriend. For Taylor, the 54-year-old man will simply be another cause now a little past 4.30 a.m. Residents of Saddlewood Court are awakened by a series of noises which clearly sound like gunshots. One of them calls 911. On the morning of the murders at about 5 a.m., I was contacted by my dispatch. They advised me that there had been several shots fired within a residence in Woodacre, California. I responded to the residence arriving approximately 45 minutes later, where I observed two deceased individuals in the apartment. It's definitely the corpse of 45-year-old Jennifer Villarin and her friend James Gamble, 54. The police are convinced that it isn't a burglary gone bad because nothing is missing. The victim's wallets and jewelry haven't been touched. So obviously, the assassin wanted to kill the people who were in the apartment. We're talking about gratuitous murder here. In Mr. Taylor's reasoning, eliminating people is the easiest way to avoid capture. But the more it progresses, the more involved it becomes and more people must be eliminated, which increases the risk of being caught. Curiously, while a police officer interrogates people, he discovers that the tenant of the small apartment which is adjacent to the house is not Jennifer Villarin. While the investigation continues in Selena's residence, the children of Thunder are hard at work. Don joins Justin and Taylor, who have rented a jet ski that will serve to get rid of all the evidence. Don helps Justin unload the duffel bags filled with the dismembered bodies of the Steinman couple and Selena Bishop. They make a few trips back and forth to the jet ski, where the two men will abandon the duffel bags filled with heavy rocks in the deep waters of the Sacramento River Delta. When Olga Land finds out about her sister Jenny's tragic death, she goes to the crime scene and is greeted by Detective Stephen Nash. He explained to me the crime scene and what he had found and, and asked me questions of who I might know. 
that that might want to do this. And I know the reason Jenny went to Pennsylvania was with a boyfriend and it didn't turn out like to be a good relationship. And I know she came back to get away. They didn't know his name. And, but he had already, he knew his name. So they had already found that out. And, uh, and I said, and Selena was dating a guy named Jordan. While she tries to answer the detective's questions, Olga wonders if Selena has been notified about her mother's murder. I had asked if anybody had notified Selena yet. And he says, well, we can't find her. Do you know where she is? And I said, she was going camping. We began an extensive search looking for her, including in the Yosemite area. They put out feelers in Yosemite and more feelers over at Great America to see if they could find her, but they never did. They talked to every friend and acquaintance of Selena that they could find, and they gradually began to piece together just itty-bitty amounts of information. One person knew that the boyfriend lived in Concord. Someone else thought that maybe he had a brother. Someone else knew he was maybe about 30 years old. There were little pieces of information that the police began to gather together as a whole. They talked to the co-workers who told her about this mysterious Jordan that Selena Bishop had been dating. In one of the very lucky breaks for the detectives, Selena had accidentally left her pager at her work at the Chubert Cafe restaurant. We were looking for a Jordan who was the boyfriend of Selena Bishop. We knew that he resided in Concord, California. A number in the pager came back to an area code which was consistent with the Concord area. One number that had been called quite frequently came back to a house in Concord with what appeared to be two brothers living there. He pulled the driver's license photos for the two brothers, whose names were Glenn Taylor Helzer and Justin Allen Helzer, and he started showing those around, he and his, his fellow detectives. And finally, someone was able to say, oh, that's the guy I've seen her with. And they made the link that Jordan and Glenn Helzer were the same person. Once they traced Jordan's pager number to Glenn Helzer, the police got a search warrant for their house. They went over at the very crack of dawn across San Francisco Bay to Concord, California. And they essentially busted down the door of the Helzer's house. They arrested Justin and Dawn without incident. As we executed the search warrant at the resident in Concord of the Helzer brothers, Jordan Taylor came out the back window in his underwear, jumped over a fence, and ran directly at me where he was taken into custody. Glenn Taylor in handcuffs is placed in a car. Since it's so hot in California, a policewoman cracks open a window to avoid suffocation. Then she talks to Glenn Taylor and explains that there's no accusation for now. They only want to verify his relation to Selena Bishop. He was sitting in the squad car and somehow managed to get out the open window and he fled through the neighborhood. Uh, he broke into a neighbor's house made her give him some sweatpants. She gives him a t-shirt and pants much too big for him. Then he decides to flee, climbs over the fence, and ends up on Concord Boulevard. Very bad choice. Glenn Taylor is immediately handcuffed and arrested. His escape lasts about 30 minutes. The police will proceed to search the Heltzer brothers' residence. The hall bathroom, it was the only area of the residence that was clean and new. Somebody had just recently replaced and cleaned the bathroom extensively. The rest of the house was very dirty and trashed. They noticed documents when they were in the Helzer's house that had the name Steinman on them. 
Concord police, just as a courtesy, had assisted in this arrest. The Concord cops said, well, wait a minute. We have a missing couple with that name. And that was when everything started to become linked. And they be it began to unravel. The cops began to unravel this whole puzzle. Later that same day that Justin and Taylor and Don were arrested, a duffel bag popped up in the Delta. And a poor, unsuspecting gentleman pulled it out of the water and opened it. And then he called police. Inside of the bags were cut up body parts which were later identified as both of the Steinmans and Selena Bishop. All three of the suspects, Jordan, Justin, and Dodd Godman, were either convicted or pled guilty at trial. At the trial, Don Godman was able to strike a deal with prosecutors. They agreed that they would not pursue a death sentence against her. And that she instead would get 37 years and eight months to life in prison. She was the one who told Justin's jury that he hit Selena on the head with a hammer, that he bashed Ivan's head on the bathroom floor, that he helped with the dismemberment. He thought that what he was doing was right in, in the largest possible sense. He believed that God would have accepted his reasoning and not have uh, condemned him for his acts because the greater purpose was so real to him because his brother had convinced him of that fact. None of this would have happened without Taylor Helzer. He was the driving force. He was the originator. He was the mastermind. Most criminals will say, I didn't do it, the others did. Taylor said, I did it, I was responsible. I think it was because he always had to be the leader, no matter what. Even in this, he could not think of being second in command. He was the Messiah, he was the new leader. He had to even take that role. And probably in his mind, he thought of being a martyr to this cause. Taylor and Justin Helzer were sentenced to death by not only the jury recommending it, but the judge confirming it. After their sentencings in 2004, both Taylor and Justin were sent to California's death row at San Quentin State Prison. Justin Helzer tried to kill himself in prison by stabbing himself in the eye with a pen. He was unsuccessful. Then in April 2013, he was successful and he hung himself with a bed sheet in his cell. Taylor Helzer remains on death. Occult killers usually torture and sacrifice in the name of Satan. On the contrary, the Helzer brothers believe that they were endowed with a divine mission to save America from its sins which leads the police investigation into a labyrinth of the darkest and most twisted of all human psyche. 